it is generally true that 90% of people would be better off just buying or 95% just buying index funds. But if your passion in life is investing, that would be like telling a world-class uh, mountain climber that because most people die climbing half dome without a rope, you shouldn't do it. Right. And it's like, well, no, you only get to do this fucking life once. And if you're world-class at something, you should fucking go do it. And what everybody else thinks about that is completely irrelevant. Only you know what you're capable of. Hello and welcome to Bitcoin with Jake. This is a podcast all about people's personal journeys to Bitcoin. I wanted to know more about the people converging on this new form of money. Why do they see value in it? What skills enable their understanding? How is it changing their lives? If you're a founder looking for funding or an investor looking to make investments, then please reach out as I develop my network in the space. Do me a favor and chuck us a five-star rating on whichever app you're using to listen or a like if you're watching it somewhere. As insignificant as this may seem, they help a startup project like this hugely. Lastly, if you have any questions at all, please just reach out. The easiest place to find me is on Twitter at Jake E. S. Woodhouse. Now, I'd like to take a quick moment to talk about our sponsor. Fast Bitcoins are a Bitcoin exchange who you should definitely take a look at next time you're thinking of making a Bitcoin purchase. They're a great team, which for me is always the key to due diligence, whilst their product has a ton of features useful to every Bitcoiner. Check out my episodes with Danny Brewster, the founder CEO, and Nathan Smith, the chief compliance officer, to learn more about the people behind the brand. Thank you to Fast Bitcoins for sponsoring the show. Now, on to today's episode. Today, I'm speaking with Mike Alfred. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Jake. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So as I mentioned briefly offline, this is a podcast about Bitcoin and about people's personal journeys. So I look forward to spending this hour with you and learning about what's brought you to the table today. So simple question to start with. You came across Bitcoin at some point. Can you remember when that was and what was your first opinion of it? And, and a little bit about your kind of journey to Bitcoin. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I was a software entrepreneur. So I was exposed to a lot of folks who were into Bitcoin early. I probably first read about it in a magazine or heard about it at a conference around like 2012, 2013. It's definitely before 2013. I'm probably closer to, to 2012 because by the time the, that big run up in 2013, I was sitting at Thanksgiving telling everybody it was going to crash down from a thousand. So I ended up being right in the short term. It did go from a thousand to 200, but obviously was dead wrong about the long-term <laughs> fundamentals because I had no idea what it was, right? So I just I started my kind of investing and trading career in the late nineties in my Stanford dorm room and, you know, trading at that time, tech stocks traded like shit coins did in 2017. And so you'd buy Infospace or Inktomi or CMGI, any of these names from way back when, and they would like double or triple in a few months. And you thought you were a genius investor. Uh, and that was a liquidity environment that sort of felt like 2017 with Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of these other tokens. And so, you know, the thing that I initially thought about Bitcoin, which in retrospect is right only in for very short time frames, which is that like this market gets very bubblicious, right? It, it becomes a massive bubble every four years approximately historically. And so the price runs probably way past what a true fundamental value is at that moment. But the problem is, is that it, it doesn't go away. Sort of like the internet, like 99% of these internet companies from the late nineties that I was trading in my dorm room went away, but the internet ended up being more probably than what you would have surmised from the valuations of those stocks in the late nineties. So it's this weird paradox where yes, a bunch of things are overvalued and also the broader superstructure of the underlying technology is probably perhaps one of the most important technologies in history. And I think the internet and Bitcoin and crypto in particular are probably two of the most important technology stacks in human history. And so the trading activity, which I kind of use pattern recognition to recognize as sort of being bubbly, ended up being the wrong call. I probably should have just bought 1% of my portfolio in Bitcoin in 2012, 2013, 2014, any time in there obviously would have been fine. No, knowing now, I, I don't make that mistake as much, you know, knowing what I know now, based on what happened before, I, I try to uh, withhold judgment and stop kind of trying to come to a final judgment so quickly in the kind of exploratory process of, of finding a new asset or a new opportunity. Interesting. And as always, when I ask that question, I get a different answer and then have lots of different areas that I can kind of drill down into. So just to kind of keep it back to basics. So you mentioned being at Stanford. So what got you there and what were you studying at the time and how did you end up investing slash trading from your dormitory room there? So I, I actually, before I went to Stanford, I sold Cutco Knives. So I, I don't know if they have Cutco internationally. I think it's mostly an American company, but they hire 
high school kids basically. And it's, it's not door to door sales. It's, it's sort of referral based sales. So you get into somebody's kitchen, you sell them a thousand dollar set of cutlery, and then you get a referral to all their friends in the neighborhood. Awesome. And I, I actually ended up being pretty good at that in the late 90s. And you did that straight out of high school? I did it in high school. Yeah. My senior okay. year, basically in, in between high school and college. And I made $14,000 in like seven weeks. So it was pretty good for a high school <laughs> student who otherwise had never had a job up until that point. And unlike most people I knew my age at that time, I immediately wanted to invest. So I started on the Vanguard website. I'm like, let me buy the Vanguard 500 index fund, right? I read a bunch of books. I, I, then I eventually got an E-Trade account and started trading individual equities, which funny enough, although I probably didn't add any alpha for five or 10 years uh, by trading individual securities, Thank God I did because you never really actually learn how to invest if you just buy an index fund. Like it's kind of this weird thing where yes, your performance may generally be okay over a long period of time, but you're not actually really investing in a sense. And so went through the kind of all those stages and, you know, in that, in that period, you know, I was studying history, but I was actually much more fascinated with markets. So I would wake up at five in the morning and trade stocks in October, November, December of my freshman year of, of college. And my, my roommates and other people I knew were going to class and I would like skip class and continue to trade uh, in the morning. So some of this is just like tactile, right? The universe, the universe said, Hey, you know, this is an interesting area. Maybe you'd be good at it. And I just kept being drawn into it. Um, and that's been a kind of a consistent theme over 20 years. Like no matter what else I've done, whether it's studying history at Stanford or starting companies or whatever, like the the underlying fascination has always been with investing. Investing is a thing that this sort of limitless opportunity set that I find fascinating sort of endlessly that that never goes away, even as I'm doing these other things. So I, I would say Stanford was interesting. Like getting into Stanford is not easy. It's a hard school to get into. You have to be smart. You have to work hard, all that. But those are kind of like that's kind of like the basic gating function, right? In life, like almost everybody at a certain level, when you're operating in business or investing or whatever is driven, works hard, is smart, high IQ, whatever, <clears throat> right? It's the differentiating factor is something deeper, like usually some level of passion that somebody has for something really particular, right? Like if you look at these entrepreneurs that create these world-changing companies, like it's their life's work to do that. It's not something they started to make money or start mm. something they started to be in Forbes yeah. or be on TV, right? And and so, you know, for, for me, like there were a lot of smart people at Stanford, but most of them weren't passionate about anything other than getting good grades and going on to the next step. And I never cared about that at all. Not even for a moment. I never cared what my GPA was never. Like I went to some of the classes, but I never really cared that much about it. Like I enjoyed reading, I enjoyed studying, I enjoyed writing, but like school had no pull over me. It was the, it was the markets and it was investing and mm -hmm. building stuff that was always interesting. Gosh, cool. And I must say, like, not that I went to Stanford, but I went to Leeds University Business School in the UK. And so much of the stuff that you get taught, it's just, there's no context and it's just not actually that interesting. And so to your point, until you're passionate about something, you, you actually don't necessarily need to learn any of that stuff. Like, what's your passion? Follow that. It's going to ask you to learn things as you follow it. And that's then relevant to what your end up. Uh, your your ultimate skill set or knowledge base actually is and therefore it's totally useful whereas a lot of what you have to kind of get grades on is completely pointless and you never remember or use it again which seems so pointless and sorry you, you mentioned you were studying history at stanford well to me <clears throat> and the experience i've had from investing history is incredibly important as a part of mm -hmm. understanding what investing is so although you were you know fascinated by markets and not attending a university just talk to me a bit about what you think the relationship to historical events is and investing. Yeah. I mean, uh, look, the, the thing that has been really helpful for me is being able to process like really large volumes of information, condensing it, distilling it, trying to kind of suss out like two or three or four key ideas, key themes, repeatable things that you can apply, like simplifying an overly complex world. And so it could have been history, it could have been philosophy, it could have been English, it could have been whatever. But I just wanted to read a lot of books, like a lot of books. I used to read uh, thousands of pages a week. I once sat down in a single sitting and read a thousand page book. I can't even imagine doing that now. I can barely get through 10 pages before I look at my phone, right? <laughs> like we all, our brains have all been hacked, right? But back yep. in the late nineties, I was just an information processing machine. Like that's just what I did. I just read everything. And, and so, you know, history was cool because I got to go back in time and like look every great person in human history and every great movement in human history and every great company in human history and every great idea and, and read every sort of angle about it and start to realize that there's a lot of different facets to all of these things, right? There's a lot of viewpoints, there's a lot of perspectives, and then you start to see patterns across time, right? And so you start to find, you get closer in your mind, at least to some fundamental truths about how the world works, about how the universe works, about 
how people make decisions about what makes somebody great and what makes them less great. And I think that all that stuff was, was super helpful, but I think maybe most importantly, again, is just being able to digest large volumes of information and then kind of cut through it, distill it and get to something really important and critical that then you can use to build something, make money, invest, et cetera. I find that to be helpful over and over again, because there's like literally an infinite amount of things you can invest in and an infinite amount of ideas to pursue. And like one of the skills that I see some of the great investors and entrepreneurs be able to do is be able to kind of really cut through all that noise and find like one, two, three high leverage areas to really focus on and work on and be great at. And if you can do that at anything in life, you have a shot at doing something really cool. And so that's the second time you've mentioned that phrase pattern recognition. Could you give me like a practical example as to what you mean by that? So you were developing obviously a system to view the world and therefore to make good investments. Um, right. Would you be able to share what you, what, what does that mean in practice? Uh, well, in, in practice, it means that you identify people, situations, uh, opportunities, et cetera, that look and feel familiar in a sense, mm -hmm. right? So like having worked with now, I don't know, 50 different CEOs over the last 10 years in different contexts uh, directly as you know, uh, an investor or a board member or having worked with them as a partner. I kind of have a good sense now when I meet somebody, it doesn't take me six months to figure out whether or not I could potentially work with somebody or whether they're likely to be successful with their pursuing. I have a much better ability to like hone in on here are the handful of factors that usually make somebody successful in this context and sort of like weight them intuitively in my mind. It doesn't mean that I don't have biases and doesn't mean I don't get it wrong from time to time, but my hit rate in making that assessment has been much better in my experience than what I've noticed from other investors. And so I think a lot of that just comes from a lot of exposure, a lot of experience, a lot of data in a sense, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's all fundamentally, you can distill it to data. Like I worked with this type of person in this many contexts and here were the outcomes. And then when you speak to somebody brand new, 10 years later, you're actually using and leveraging all the experiences you had working with these 50 other executives in other contexts. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you can call that wisdom if you want, maybe, right? Like some of it's just getting old and having a lot of experiences in your bank, but pattern recognition is just using those past experiences to make a better assessment of what you think is going to happen in the future. So you're not necessarily predicting the future, but you're getting a better uh, experience weighted uh, kind of viewpoint as to what's likely to happen. And so your ability to probabilistically weight future outcomes gets better over mm -hmm. time. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention was the word probability. So it's like, okay, I've seen this type of character in this type of situation before and it went sure. wrong or sure. it went well. And therefore the probability of it happening again is stronger as a result of whatever that and, correlation and, might and be. And it's, it's ultimately about maximizing your expected value, right? As an investor, right? As a, mm -hmm. as a company builder, as somebody who's trying to create wealth, right? Because if you want to distill it all down, right? Like a lot of business is just creating, it's creating wealth and you can do that as a CEO, you can do that as an investor, whatever. But you know, like a good example would be poker, right? You don't always win every hand where you have aces versus queens, mm -hmm. uh, but you do win if you have a thousand reps of that situation, you do tend to win about 80% of the time. Now, any given thousand, you know, simulations of that setup could cause a small variance to 75% or 85% for short periods of time, because just the law of nature says the variance is possible. But with any large enough sample set, you tend to get similar results when you have similar uh, setups. The, the challenge with comparing poker to the real world is the real world is much more complex. It's not a closed Close, yeah. system. Poker is two, there's two, each player has two cards and there's not an infinite amount of variations of outcomes, right? There's, it's, there's a set amount. It doesn't mean that you don't, if you flip a coin a few times that you won't get heads eight times or, and tails eight times another time, but it does mean over a long period of time, it, it very closely approximates like exactly what those odds are. Life is much more complex and there's more factors. But again, if you have a lot of data, you have a lot of experience, your ability in general to wait out future outcomes, I think gets better, especially if you're really focused on it, right? Like literally that's all I do. I'm a decision-making machine now. Right? It's like, where do I deploy capital? What's the next best strategy? What's the next best decision, et cetera. Like it, it's just a decision-making game. Well, wow. yeah. And I'd love to dig more into that. I want to draw back to though, before we do your opening comments, you mentioned you're a software entrepreneur, a mm -hmm. software entrepreneur. Um, what intrigued me about some investors I met in the early stage equity space. So angel investing when I was in London a few years ago, to me, the most interesting investors were people that actually built and sold companies and they just, they could see through all the crap and it was basically just like focusing on the people. Do you think this person has got something really special about them? If so, probably not a bad bet and do that across, you know, a number of different companies. What was it like building a company? Teach me a little bit about the, the market that you were in, 
the the challenges that it involved and and what that process was like yeah and just to to your point that you just made seed stage investing is very much about people right because you don't really have a business yet you don't really have customers you don't have revenue in a lot of cases if you're pre-revenue and so you're making a bet on people whereas later stage investing growth stage investing post ipo public investing Mm -hmm. you you have a lot more data you have a lot more to look at beyond people because actually a really good scale public business is not about people at all in a sense, right? Because a really good business could be run by an idiot. Like Mm. you and I could both run Pepsi. We wouldn't necessarily maybe run it as well as the current CEO, but like if we ran it for three years, probably the stock would continue to go up because it's such a fucking good business Mm. uh, that it just continues to, to print money no matter who's running it. So just, I thought that was an interesting angle to take. Okay. Yeah. One. Great. No, I, I follow you. But I think people so, matter a lot more early stage than they do. Well, and, and from my early stage experience, cause I tried to get a few businesses off the ground that didn't necessarily work. You know, you create these pitch decks and the only thing you know about the pitch deck to be true is that the pitch deck is wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like as founders of startup businesses, you don't know what's going to happen, but you make it look like there's going to be this amazing sure. hockey stick growth. But at the end of the day, all an investor knows is that this guy sat down with this other co-founder or whatever and they know something different to the rest of the world and i believe in them and and, and yeah and it's a good point that that is that is true but at the same time like if you look at a lot of the most successful businesses the pitch deck the the hockey stick chart for revenue was wrong but the general idea is usually right so true. the general That's idea that cool. people yeah. want to call a car from their phone because it would be more convenient than calling a taxi from the bar and waiting an hour and not knowing if they're coming yeah. Like that, that is a superior product, right? And that is a real problem that if they could build that, because we now have mobile phones with location awareness on them, and we can build a network to, to do that. And we can create a marketplace that has supply and demand, and we can bring that together. Then that's more or less what happened, even if the numbers in the deck were totally wrong. And I found that to be true with my company, right? Like we wanted to provide transparency into the U S retirement plan market. So back in 2007, 2008 timeframe, just realized that there was no kind of Morningstar rating. There was no way to figure out whether or not your 401k plan is good. So if you worked at Microsoft or Amgen or uh, General Electric, et cetera, right? Your employee there, you get this US retirement plan. It's called a 401k. You don't get to choose which funds are in the plan. You don't get to choose the fees. You don't get to choose the match structure. The, all those things are just provided to you by your HR department and your CFO. Somebody made a decision that didn't involve you, right? But it impacts you if you work there for 30 years. And so I said, the only way to make sure these plans are good and to hold all of these companies accountable is to have enough data to publish industry-wide ratings of these plans. And that's what we did. We got the U.S. government to release previously unreleased public data, but, but it actually needed, we had to send a Freedom of Information Act request like hundreds of times to get them to release it. And they had to, the Department of Labor had to change their systems in order to deliver it at scale. But we got this data out and there's audited financial statements of all these plans. We built our own proprietary rating system where we scored every large U.S. retirement plan. So Google's plan and Pfizer's plan and Amgen's plan and all, all the large companies, right? You could just go on the website, brightscope.com, and you could look those plans up. And it actually did change the market, right? Because these companies, like the, I remember the first week, Chevron contacted us and said, how come our match structure rating is so low? We just saw this in CNN. And like, we give so much money to our employees. I'm like, well, we went into the, the actual audited statement. They had misfiled. The, in the column where they were supposed to put the data about how much money they, they gave to the employees through the match plan, they didn't put it in the right place. And so our technology, uh-huh. which, which like opti- optically character recognizes some of the data, but then has a human component where we read through the, the free flowing text also, and then input that in database, they didn't see that. And so the rating was actually wrong, but they, we worked together to help them figure out how to file it correctly the next year. And their rating that actually Chevron had one of the best plans in the space. So it was a really interesting company, right? Because because we put a lot of pressure on the system to lower fees and make these plans better. But then we realized in order to build a real business, we had to sell the data to Fidelity and T. Mm. Price and Bank of America and Schwab and BlackRock. And mm. so I ended up learning the asset, like the large scale asset management business in part from selling a lot of data to these companies and helping their sales teams um, figure out how to uh, do a better business in, in the 401k market. So I ended up working with all like the heads of distribution and the heads of sales and some of the product people to figure out how to better position their product to these plans. And that company got to a little over 10 million in revenue, like 70 or 80 employees. And then I sold it to a private equity back uh, software roll up in 2016. So that was awesome. like my first, first liquidity event. It was a good company, got to do a lot of really interesting work, you know, raised 6 million or 5 million in equity, hired 70 people, worked with the government. Like the government was actually our largest customer, believe it or not. So like T-Row, yeah. BlackRock and 
and uh, Great West, all these guys would pay five, 600,000 a year, but the government collectively actually paid us more. And we did a lot of work with like the House Education Labor Committee, Labor uh, Senate Aging Committee, the GAO, et cetera. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting company because even though it never got very big, it had a broad impact on the U.S. retirement plan sector. And sorry, Mike, it was, you mentioned Brightscope. Was that the name yeah, of the company? Yeah, Brightscope.com. Awesome. awesome. No, well done. And, and I mean, to me, I then have so many questions. So, you know, how did you come across the idea? It must have been a problem that you experienced. Did you build it with someone else or you went, went alone? What were some of the, the challenges you faced during that process that really fucking took you out of you? Like, what was the, the hardest moment? And then equally you know, a bit more about like how it all felt like it just, it's really incredible to hear experience firsthand from people who've had an idea, taken that all the way through to exit. Cause it's, it's pretty rare, frankly. Yeah. I mean, look, it's a journey. It was an eight year journey. And the first time is the hardest because you don't know anything, right? You don't even know what you don't know. You don't know how to incorporate. You don't, you don't know how a fee deferral agreement works. You don't know how to structure a, an equity around a convertible note or a safe. We didn't even have safes back then. Nobody did a safe until whatever Y Combinator started recommending that to their companies. Mm. Never hired an engineer, never hired a VP of engineering, right? Had never sold a 300,000 plus enterprise contract. <laughs> I'd never been on CNBC or NPR, or Fox business before, right? So like I did all that stuff just totally by feel. And I think, you know, back to my, history. Like I was a pretty serious musician. You know, when I was 15, my mom sent me to the Berklee College of Music in Boston. I spent like five weeks over the summer just playing with like world-class jazz and fusion musicians. I was very, very dedicated. And at one point I thought I, I might actually be a musician at that age. And I was always more gravitating towards improvisation versus like sheet music and playing like preset stuff. And I feel like that's basically been the story of my career. Like if you looked at my my history background, my trading, et cetera, you would have been like, how did you get into software? And the reality is it was just very serendipitous, right? Like I was helping individual investors with their portfolios. And I realized they have these 401k plans and they don't really know what to do with them. And so then a, a guy from Hewlett Packard, Dan Weeks had some like rudimentary software to start doing this kind of analysis. And my brother and I, who were all, it was also the co-founders. It was my brother, Ryan, Dan Weeks and I, um, when we sort of looked at the market, we're like, wait a second, there's got to be, there's got to be something bigger here. There's like got to be a way that we can really impact this space. And so it was just, it was sort of like being incubated on the side while I was, you know, helping individuals with, with their accounts. So it was, it was germane, right? It was in the same kind of general universe, but it was a very different idea to go from being a retail individual uh, advisor, helping like people with their financial plans to, Hey, I'm going to build this nationwide platform that everybody's going to use the data including all the large asset managers and the government. And so that was a big leap, right? Cause I leaped from like the local stage of like helping 70 year olds, uh, finish their retirement planning to, you know, advising large companies on like what their strategy should be broadly in terms of what they should do in the 401k plan and helping the government understand like the, the state of play and what was going on and, you know, helping the media tell stories in the marketplace about how good 401k plans are. Like, is it, are people actually getting a good deal when they contribute to these plans? And um, so it was just, look, at, it, there's no way to explain exactly how it happened because it sort of happened very indirectly, right? It didn't, it mm -hmm. wasn't something I didn't sit around going, I'm going to become a software entrepreneur. In fact, I don't even think we knew we were software entrepreneurs at first. We just wanted to solve a specific problem, which was bringing transparency to 401k plans. And it turns out in order to do that, you need a lot of data and you need a lot of software, but I didn't think of that at the start. I thought, I thought I could do it probably without having to do any of that. It turns out mm -hmm. you need a lot of data, a lot of software, right. To, to crack. Well, and then that it's, the, it's the technology that you build that really drives the value at the end of the day. Cause no one else has that technology. You built it right. and the data, but the data itself together. Case, yes. Because what happened was we used the public data to incentivize the, these large companies to participate in a data consortium. So we got them all in a dinner in New York. We had like BlackRock and PIMCO and MFS and all these funds, T row in a room. And we said, Hey, if you guys all share your private sales reporting data into our database, we'll anonymize and aggregate it. And we'll feed you back data that you don't have. That's been anonymized from other participants. So it's mm -hmm. like a data consortium network. Mm -hmm. And so that was built on top of the public data. So we literally like government gave us un sort of improved, right. Public data that needed a lot of work. So we had to do a lot of enrichment just to get that public data to like a higher standard. But then with that public data had enough value that we we're able to convince these private companies, large private companies to share their private sales data into a separate database that sat on top of the public database. And so now we have this proprietary data set that like 
is you can't replicate it because you'd have to get all 30 or 40 of the firms that still participate in that today, by the way, it's still, it's a 12 or $13 million a year product that's owned by a much larger company now, but it, it literally, you can't get it because these firms only want to share their sales data with one provider, right? And they only want to share it with the one that everybody else participates in. So it turns out it's more of a political problem than a, mm. than a software or technology problem, but the net result is valuable proprietary data that provides consistent value to the customer and, and also is a form of lock-in, right? Because they can't get that data anywhere else. Cool. Okay. Because it, it struck me actually when you first mentioned that you got the government to give you some data that hadn't previously been released, the the kind of gov tech space, although lucrative if you get in I went there. To gov, I went to gov 2.0. Yeah, way, it, with Tim O'Reilly way back at the, the first event that they did that I spoke at it. Okay, the presentation cool. Because yeah. it's notoriously difficult in in many ways to to do business with the government because of their you know complete lack of interest in some instances of, of timelines and their cost abilities are just different to, to to working in the private marketplace. So really interesting that you managed to to get a business up and running in that space. Yeah, cool. Okay, and so some something that you mentioned earlier was that you're a decision making machine. And when you take us through what you've just explained, it's it's extraordinary how many decisions you would have had to make during that process. So can you share if if you have any, like how do you make decisions? Like what have you come up with some kind of process that you go through each time that you're looking to decide what direction to go in? Um, and because I know lots of people, they take inspiration from all over the place or they have a very systematic process or it's very just gut feel. This is what we're doing. Everyone's different, right? So mm -hmm. can you share anything around that? Yeah. So, so one thread that we haven't talked about at all is that I became an ultra marathon runner in like 2008. Mm. Right. So I, I awesome. had just run a half marathon fast. I, I ran, I lost 35 pounds. I ran like a 130 half marathon and I was proud of myself. Quick. Well done. And so I went, I went to a, I went to a bar and this girl was like, Oh, that's no big deal. Like I was just sitting at the bar having a beer and she was like, Oh, that's whatever. <laughs> like, who cares? You know, there are people. What, running what do you mean? Love? I've just done an hour and a half. Fuck yeah, you. I did an hour and a half, Like you know, I'm doing well. And she's like, no, there's this guy, Dean Carnassus, who runs like a hundred miles now. I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. No, she's like, no, check it out. It's called ultra marathon, man. I literally went like straight home and order rush shipped ultra marathon, man. And I got like 30 pages into this book and it just spoke to me. I think this was, this was like Oh seven, maybe mm -hmm. early Oh eight going into early Oh eight. Maybe I think it was Oh seven. It was fall of Oh seven. And I bought that book and I just knew it just, I said, I'm going to become like a very serious competitive uh, ultra marathon runner. And that's what I did. Like over the course of the next few years, I, I ran a 50 a few months later, and then I ran a hundred miler the following year. I finished my first hundred miler, I think in, in, in early 2009. Um, I think it was 2009. It was either 2008 or 2009. Um, and then I had a long, I did like 20 or 25 ultras over a decade, including my wow. PR at hundred miles. I ran 16 hours, 12 minutes in 2015 at the U S national championship, which was like the 38th fastest time in the U S that year. Uh, so like 16 nine, hours, um, is over what minutes. distance? A hundred miles. So it was nine, 943 pace for hundred miles it, it, on trails, like off road, right around a lake and up some little, yeah. uh, little hills and stuff. And you run all, all day through the night. I think I finished at like 10 or 11 at night. It starts at like five wow. in the morning. Wow. And, and so I was very dedicated. I even did Leadville in 2019, Leadville 100, which starts at 10,000 feet of elevation and goes up to 12. It's like one of the tougher hundred milers in the U S I did it in what, 20, 24 hours and like 52 awesome. minutes, something like that. So I became a very dedicated mountain endurance athlete. And I think one of the things I learned in doing like 20, 30, 40 mile runs, usually by myself, like in the mountains is that some of the best decision-making time is when you're not actively considering a specific decision. So if you're sitting at your computer, drinking a Red Bull and like trying to uh, brute force your way through a, a set of decisions in general, I think your decision-making quality is going to be lower. What I've found for me, at least, and this works really well, is if I have a very important decision, the more time I can take to sort of passively consider. So basically being aware in the back of my mind, uh, setting the scene for sort of making that decision over some predetermined period of time, which by the way, could be weeks for something really important, but then not actively considering and just going for a long run for like three, four, five, six hours. What I found happened is my mind would make, I don't know the way the synapses were firing or it was all the endorphins from being up high or running really far and getting my own ass kicked but they would fire in a certain way that I would find elegant solutions to problems that like I had no idea how to, how to fix when I was sitting at my desk or like actively thinking about it. Mm. Um, and so again, this is just one example. Everybody has their kind of approach that works for them, but for very high level decisions and for things that seem 
initially very challenging and you're not sure how you're going to solve them, the long runs with sort of the passive consideration seem, seem to work really well. Brilliant. Well, shout out to my friend Jigsy, who's a, uh, a big runner, completely changed the way he approached life and now is you know jogging all the time and he does you know, crazy ultras as well. He, he loves it. He, he's doing it all the time. I'm hoping now that I'm going to, I've quit my job, I'm going to go full time on this podcast. I have more time to spend outside of looking after my young family to do things like this. And I 100% plan on doing it. And just to share a memory of mine. So can't remember when this was exactly around about 2014. Um, I was living in Singapore and three, me and two mates, we did a 50 K ultra in the Himalayas in China. So we mm -hmm. took a flight up to, I think it's Kunming and then up to, it was called the Shangri-La ultra marathon. And we, we were like, I think the racetrack was at its lowest 1500 meters above sea level. And at its highest was 3000. And I, it took me nine and a half hours and I was ninth in the race. Like I was a complete amateur, just rocked up and had a crack at it. And it was an extraordinary experience in terms of like how long it took. You were in this beautiful place. You're literally on mm -hmm. little goat tracks in Chinese villages that haven't seen, you know, tourists ever. And it was an incredibly rich experience. Just like, fuck, that was absolutely awesome. I loved it. And that's it. You know, so you the, know exactly last, what I'm talking like, about. I don't even I don't even have to explain to you how magical it is because you've had oh, the experience. It was it's very rare. You know, I want to get back out there. It's just one of those things. I got small kids and you know, anyway, life kind of got got in the way slightly. So it's something I'd love to get back to doing. And you feel incredibly free. And there's something that just came into me in the last so we got to the we got to the 45 kilometer mark and one of my friends henry had had dropped back already and it was just george and i he was like look mate you go for it and just something inside me just i powered up the last it's making me shiver even now thinking about it the last 5ks and i overtook about four people in the incline up that feels so good k's to in the toughest and a half. part of the race in the toughest had, part of the I race i just had gas people. in the tank i was like fucking bring it on you had the tunes on you're like this is epic and I've never done it since. So yeah, maybe this is an inspirational moment where I have to kind of get back to that moment and look into it. But yes, to really resonate with you on that experience. And, and I love that that's some of the places that you process. It's so true, like forcing ideas through when at a computer, like, is that a natural place for a human being to be? Not at all. Whereas out in the wilderness running around much more so. Yeah. How it's cool. Primal. It's primal. And you know, life is short. Like I say this over and over again, like, like life is really short and so if you're doing anything that doesn't give you joy, you probably should stop and do exactly what, what you need and want to do for yourself. And so for me, it was like, I knew I had to do it. I got as far as I could get and I kind of crashed, right? Like, cause I was very competitive for years. I won a 50 miler called the PCT 50 in the mountains east of San mm -hmm. Diego, 724, I think for that race with like, like 10 or 12,000 feet of climb, like pretty serious. Wow. Um, maybe it wasn't maybe that much. It was like eight or 10, but you know, it was like a tough, a tough course in the mountains. And I just trained really hard and went out there and I had planned to, I went, planned to go hard from the beginning. I let five or six guys go in front of me. And then I just systematically passed them across 30 miles and ran up. Like by the time I was at mile 30, I was way ahead and I never let up the lead. The guy, I think the second place was like 12 or 13 minutes after me. And you know, those types of experience, like being alone in the mountains all day, the rest of the race behind you chasing you feels really good. And to your point about passing people on the climb, that was always my thing. Like how in a hundred, can I still be running after mile 50 or 60? Cause yeah, I don't know where it came from. Down. I was like, a lot of people slow down at night and they slow down after mile 30, 40, 50. But mm -hmm. if you can train to run at mile 70 or 80, you end up passing everybody. I remember at Rocky raccoon, I passed cause it was a loop course, five loops of 20 miles mm -hmm. in the third and fourth and fifth loop. I was just passing people like every couple hundred wow. yards. And it felt so, good because so I was still doing you, really well. How do you, uh, I mean, so there's, there's no surprises that, that staying in tune with your body and having a, an athletic interest in your life, it keeps you healthier in the mind, healthier in the body. Sure. What do you think are some of the biggest benefits you've got from this? And it, is it just the decision-making side of things or has it seeped into other parts of your life? No, I mean, it's everything. You just asked about decision-making and probably one of the more critical things that's unique that I've done is those long runs in the mountains and this kind of a passive consideration of different ideas during that process. But, but no, of course, it's much more comprehensive than that. I mean, you change the way you eat, you change the way you value your health. You're much more sensitive to variations in your health. Like people who are not in shape and eat and drink poorly and don't sleep well, don't even realize how sick they are, mm -hmm. right? Because they, they don't see any differences in their performance because their performance levels are so low. Whereas if you're a high level athlete and you're used to running hundred miles in the mountains, 
if you even just sleep a little bit differently, right? Or if you feel your heart rate's off a little bit, or you feel your energy has dipped and you can't quite put your finger on it, it can be a signal of as to something else going on in your life. Mm. I, I feel that that's been helpful. It's like a set of guardrails for your health that that is more organic, right? Because you, you're managing it. You're not waiting for the doctor to say, Hey, your blood pressure is a little high. Like I know when my blood pressure is too high, mm. I can tell you based on how I've slept, right. Whether I've been sick recently, how I've been eating, how much I've had to drink in the recent days, right. How much stress I'm experiencing because I can actually feel it before I can go and check blood pressure and it'll just tell me what I pretty much already, already know. And I can tell that from my performance on my daily run. Like I go out now and even though I'm not training for ultras, I still try to run five miles every day. And so I went out today and I ran five miles and whatever, eight minute pace, something like that, which is pretty good for a 40 something year old, but not at all what I used to do, but I'm still able to use that five mile run as like a pretty good barometer of like, okay, I felt really good and really strong the last couple of times out. Like, obviously I'm doing a better job of managing my stress mm. or maybe, you know, I haven't had a drink in four days, right? Like, which is actually true. I'm trying to have longer streaks of no drinking, <laughs> but having a beer or two every once in a while, I think is actually healthy for me. Right. And like, that's another thing, you know, what's right for one person always isn't right for the other, particularly with these, these types of things. Right. Um, some people can drink coffee and it, and it's actually good for them. And other people drink coffee and it, and it's like toxic and it, mm. it makes their life worse. They don't sleep as well. They're, they're much more stressed. They have heart problems, et cetera. Other people can drink three cups a day and, and then they sleep like a baby and their blood pressure is low and they can exercise more. And um, so I think, you know, another takeaway too, is ultra runners generally have done more experimentation and kind of dialed in that like collection of things that you need to array around your health to make sure that you remain healthy for long periods of time. So like diet is a part of that. Like anybody can prescribe you a diet, but only you really know how you feel when you eat certain foods, mm. right? Only you really know how you feel when you're subjected to certain types of stress, particularly if it's in a certain sequence, right? Cause running itself is a form of a stressor. And when you pile on relationship stress or you pile on financial stress, or you pile on business stress or market stress mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. people break at various different points. And you can feel that breakage through heart rate, blood pressure, energy on your runs, sleeping, et cetera. And so I think it's just a lot of people are using devices now, but I think that actually stunts your ability to be more intuitive and listen, right? So like we're all How losing- do you feel? We all losing these primal senses that we used to have before we all had devices and machines. And when we used to have to like negotiate our way to a new place using only our hippocampus, our hippocampuses were, were much more alert and, and active. And I think the same thing's happening with these devices. If you put a, something on my wrist to tell me how I'm feeling, I'm going to lose that intuitive sense mm. of how I'm doing. And I haven't been willing to do that. So like I use a watch only to track since an elevation gain, just because I think it's helpful um, to understand across periodization, right? So like across multiple weeks, did I go up for three weeks and down for a week on elevation gain, for example, right? Because it's a good way to stay healthy over time is to monitor that. But outside of that, I haven't been willing to do more than that because I really value being able to do it by intuition. Interesting. And so one of the things I've um, only just on the journey in a sense, but the Bitcoin in many ways has helped me take more responsibility for myself. So where is my money? How do I look after my wealth? Who owns it? Where is it? What do I want to do with it? There is a, a certain level of proof of work, of course, that's required in understanding what Bitcoin is in the first place to feel comfortable with putting, you know, a, a decent percentage of your portfolio into it. But then the more you learn, the more you realize, well, actually, maybe you didn't own any of the other things that you thought you owned before in comparison to what it means to self custody Bitcoin. And this also transfers into personal choices. So whether or not you're in shape, what you're eating, how you feel and taking responsibility for your health. So to try and draw it back into Bitcoin a little bit, this passion for ultra running is really coming through and it's awesome to hear. And <clears throat> that's also taught you so many other things. What, is there any similarities that Bitcoin has had to your life or has it changed you in any way since you've learned about it? Um, and ultimately, I was going to ask you about like what percentage of your portfolio is in Bitcoin, if you're willing to share that, of course. Has it as an asset, you know, you mentioned all the way back at the start of this conversation, it was a thousand bucks, it's going to crash guys, but it keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, how is it kind of how does it feel like now that you've learned more about Bitcoin and and has it had any impact on your day to day life in that sense? Yeah. So there's a uh, multi-layered. Yeah. Uh, huge. Sorry. Question, I almost right? asked too many things. At the you same asked like time. four or five questions, but, but I, I think, you know, back to the original point, I was already on this kind of vector of low time preference and cool. living below my means and small lifestyle. Right. I've always been like a saver, not a spender. Like you, you won't catch me in a Lamborghini 
you won't even catch me in a, like a cheap sports car, right? Like I drive an old 10 year old Ford F-150 truck that I like because it suits my lifestyle. I like to drive up to Colorado and Wyoming in the summer and spend a lot of time running and driving up these long dirt roads and parking and going to the waterfall. And right. I don't need a car to, to impress anybody. It doesn't do anything for me at all. And so like Bitcoin to me, it wasn't a revelation where I was like, oh, now I'm going to change my life. It was more like, though, this is an extension of who I already am mm. once I understood what it was. Right. I'm like, oh, wow. This is just, it's another way to store my wealth that may be more efficient in the ways that I'm doing it now. Because I spent a lot of time storing wealth anyway, but historically I've done that in, in corporate ownership and stocks and real estate, et cetera. And this is a, a very cool way. Now, that said, Bitcoin was more volatile, at least for most of its history than these other assets. And so once I really understood what Bitcoin was, and then I compared it to the volatility, I said, wow. Maybe, maybe volatility is even less important than I thought. I kind of knew that volatility wasn't the same thing as risk intuitively as an investor. Like permanent loss is, is real risk. Like the risk that your company you bought goes to zero is real risk. Mm. But a company going from $40 to $20 isn't real risk if you understand the balance sheet and you know why it can't ever be worth zero. And so Bitcoin just like accentuated and accelerated that component of my understanding. And so what I found is actually my tolerance for Bitcoin's volatility made me more tolerant of equity vol volatility. I used to get so annoyed when a, a company I owned had a bad earnings report and the stock went down 5%. It's funny, since I've owned Bitcoin, I don't care at all. You know, I've had stocks go down 10 plus percent after earnings. I don't feel anything anymore. And mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin was a big part of like the reconditioning process because I know Bitcoin's more valuable than its short-term price. And so if I accept that for Bitcoin, why, why do I think that's any different just because the market's freaking out about short-term earnings for, for a company? So I, I, for me, and again, everybody's different, but for me, probably one of the biggest learnings is just volatility tolerance. Mm. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So I was going to shift to a couple of audience questions that came up. So first of all, to my friend, Dylan Murray, shout out for his shit tweets, but he also wanted to under, understand how you ended up on the board of Iris. And I'd like to just kind of jam into that question, you know, your journey to Bitcoin mining. So um, yeah. How'd you end up on the board of a Bitcoin mining business? Yeah. So um, I sold my last company that I was CEO of to Nidig in November, 2020. And then on, on like January 4th of that year, the then CEO of Nidig was like, Hey, Mike, we want you to run all strategy and like M and A for the company. I said, Oh, that sounds great. And almost immediately the very first deal I did, like the next month was I bought a Canadian mining equipment lender is in that role. Right. So I recommended for, for purchase this company. We did that acquisition we integrated it. That business has grown pretty dramatically since it was inside of Nidig. Um, I also did a large investment. I won't say the size because it's on a podcast, but a very large investment into a, a large private Bitcoin miner at like a $500 million valuation that that company later raised at a 5 billion valuation, like within nice. that year. So that was a really nice uh, markup. And then I led a series A for like a mining services business that does mining pools and other things. Right. And so what happened is in like a three or four month period last spring, I think I talked to like pretty much all 50 of the top, you know, Western industrial scale Bitcoin miners, public and private. I had some sort of connectivity with the leadership teams, the board, et cetera, right. with all these companies. And of the kind of 50 I talked to, Iris was definitely in like the top small handful of the firms I was most impressed with. And I had a lot of interactions with Dan and Will Roberts, the two founders there. Uh, obviously, Nidig ended up becoming a big lender to, to Iris. I recommended actually an equity investment um, in the company as well. That Canadian lender we bought already had a convertible note investment in the company. So there's all this connectivity. And so when I left Nidig, I mean, basically Nidig went from having no mining exposure at all on January 3rd of last year to by the time I left that summer, they were one of the biggest players in the mining ecosystem, right? In terms of providing equity, debt, and other services to these miners. And so, you know, that you make a lot of noise in a small collegial market like that when you come out of nowhere and people all of a sudden have to pay attention to you. Mm -hmm. um, and so those guys called me shortly after and said, look, like we're thinking of going public. We may turn over one of the board members of all the people that we've interacted with in this space, you know, over the last year or so, like you're one of the people we most enjoyed working with. And you seem to have a lot of insights on what's happening in the space and from a strategy and a fundraising and a capital market standpoint. And I was obviously flattered to um, be asked to to join and it made sense for me because I wasn't working or doing anything. I was just investing my own money as I have been since then over the last, whatever, 16 months or so. And so it keeps me connected with the space and I've been able to add a lot of value in different ways. And, you know, most board members are just checking boxes a lot of the time, right? They're compliance and corporate governance 
type of people like hire and fire mm-hmm. the CEO, set the set the comp and do the audit committee and run the comp committee and run the uh, nomination committee, et cetera. And a lot of times people don't actually have any real connectivity with the space that that company operates in. They're just corporate governance experts, like they're professional board members. And I like to think that I am a professional board member in a sense that I discharge my duties professionally, but maybe more importantly, I have direct connectivity, active connectivity with most of the large companies in the space. Mm. I analyze them for my own investing purposes. I comment on them publicly. I go on Bloomberg and talk about them, right? And so it's kind of actually really synergistic because Iris is trying to build a bigger brand in North America. We trade on NASDAQ, right? The ticker is IREN, but Mm. it's an Australian domiciled parent company and a Canadian set of infrastructure assets. So it's actually, even though it's a really well-run company, it's kind of complicated. It's kind of dispersed. Um, and we don't have great name recognition in the U S. So part of the thinking was, Hey, you know, even though I'm an independent board member, like I'm a reg FD spokesperson, I'm actually authorized to speak, not necessarily on behalf of, cause I don't actually speak as Iris, but I speak about Iris mm. and there's no prohibition in doing that based on our structure. So it, it works out really well for everybody. I get to stay connected with the space and add value and helping on strategy, fundraising, operations, et cetera. And, you know, they get somebody who's visible in the U S market and respected by the rest of the ecosystem. So works out. Awesome. And those, those are the best relationships, right? When there's synergy on both sides and each person, whatever the agreement that's been reached feels like they're getting value. And that's always the, in my experience, the best way to, to move forwards. I'm intrigued as to your feeling as to where the Bitcoin mining market's at today. So could you just teach me a bit about, you know, what's the future got in store for Bitcoin mining? Well, Bitcoin mining is a incredibly interesting space, right? It's absolutely foundational to Bitcoin. So if you, if you believe in Bitcoin and you like Bitcoin, and you think it has a long uh, future in front of it of success, then almost certainly Bitcoin miners are going to get larger, right? They're going to be get more efficient. They're going to have better chips. They're going to be better run operationally. Um, the, the challenge is that every four years, the amount of Bitcoin that you can mine gets cut in half. And so, mm-hmm. you know, and it's all in one day, right? So literally from one day to the next, uh, the amount of Bitcoin that, that is even available to be mined gets cut in half. Now, the idea over time is that that systematic scarcity should increase the price. And so it doesn't necessarily in the long run hurt the revenue. But what tends to happen every cycle is that a certain number of the miners get over levered. They spend too much on machines. They borrow too much money. They get out over their skis. And then... What happens? The price drops. So their revenue gets cut right as you know more, more capacity comes online. So the difficulty goes up and the hash price drops. And so that's where we're at. We're at like a, we went from like a historic period of mining profitability in sort of Q3, Q4 last year mm. to now like a historic level, usually near bottom type of level for for profitability on the other side, right? Because it's really not that good of a market right now, given the the playoff between the price of Bitcoin and the cost to, to mine a Bitcoin, um, especially with like whatever we're at 260 exahash or 270, it's just like relentlessly going higher. So mm-hmm. uh, paradoxically, I think this is a wonderful time to invest. I've gone on the record and saying that I like firms like HUD8 because HUD8 basically only hodls Bitcoin. They have like 8,000 Bitcoin on, in HODL now. I spoke with the CEO very recently and she reiterated that just like the last couple of times we've spoken, they're not going to change that strategy. They have no need to change that strategy. They've been able to grow conservatively. And so they'll issue a little bit of equity and debt and they may dilute the shareholders, but they're not selling their Bitcoin. And so that's one approach. And I like that approach and I'm a large shareholder and I'm, I'm likely to add because I think if you're going to buy hot, now's a good time. If you have a sort of a three to five year time frame, And then I also like the Iris approach, which is just to build out high grade industrial scale infrastructure operate it as efficiently as possible, and then liquidate your Bitcoin every day uh, to minimize the amount of equity and debt financing you have to use to grow. I think both approaches could work over time. Um, If you really want to be invested in in companies that hold their Bitcoin though, I think HUT is going to end up being one of the best vehicles to to do that. And I put my money where my mouth is. I have a large and growing stake in that company. And, but you know, the challenge with investing is like, Last year, when everybody was really excited about these companies, they traded at much higher valuations. I mean, Marathon was trading at five or six billion, you know, eighty something dollars a share. Hut traded all the way up to sixteen or seventeen a share, right? Just recently, it bottomed out at like a dollar thirty. Uh, last week, it was at a dollar seventy-seven. It it literally skyrocketed what twenty percent yesterday. Wow. But it, there's going to be a lot of volatility. But my view, like Hut is a two dollar and thirty cent. $2.20 stock right now. My view is that if HUT survives, which I believe they will, because if you look at their balance sheet, they have almost no debt. 
and they've got 8,000 Bitcoin almost, right? And so like, what do you think that Bitcoin is going to be worth next cycle? My, my view is it'll be worth, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 a coin by the end of the next halving cycle. And so if they get up to 10, 12, 15,000 Bitcoin, they're going to have a billion or 2 billion of Bitcoin on the balance sheet and their current market cap is whatever it is, 300 million. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there could be some dilution along the way, right? And there's going to be some surprises, but I think there's a margin of safety there investing now. And, and I do view it as like a 30 to $50 stock at some point in the next five years. And so I like that setup. I like anytime I can buy a stock for two or $3 that I think is a $30 stock uh, with a balance sheet that sort of implies that it, its bankruptcy risk is really low. I like to own those types of setups. In general, when you do that over time, you make money. Nice. And so one of the challenges that, I mean, I see today at least is once you've really figured out what Bitcoin is, that's all I really want to buy. And yeah. there are, of course, other ways that you can you know, invest and in buying equity in businesses that you think might be able to outpace Bitcoin are also options. Is that actually how you look at it? Are you looking at it? I, now you could just hold Bitcoin. Do you have to compare every investment opportunity to holding Bitcoin or do you see them as slightly different types of, of investment? Yeah. I can see the merit of people who want to use Bitcoin as a hurdle rate for everything. I think that's fine, but I'm a company builder and a company investor too. And I'm all probably always going to own equities alongside mm -hmm. Bitcoin. In fact, I'm starting a fund right now and the awesome. fund's going to hold Bitcoin and equities in one portfolio. And I think the portfolio construction is actually going to be quite interesting and it's going to have unique risk and return characteristics, but, but no, I, I don't necessarily think you need to compare it. I think it's possible that for various periods of times, coin miners will outperform Bitcoin because it's a kind of a highly levered instrument. It's highly levered to the price of Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin goes up a lot, the miners could go up more, uh, but they're also just high quality infrastructure businesses. The ones that own their own land, they own their own, you know, data centers, et cetera, right? Like those data centers could be used for something else. And so there's residual asset value there as well. And there's a margin of safety around those businesses if you really understand them and you buy them at the right prices. So I'm, I'm a value investor at my very soul. And so as much as I love Bitcoin, I'm never going to own hundred percent of my portfolio in Bitcoin. In fact, every maxi you've seen espouse that they've almost all had to retrade on that idea, including most recently Tina, who was lambasting me last year for talking about mining stocks. And he's like, I, I don't know why you don't know anything about Bitcoin. And then he sort of mea culpa a couple of months ago and was like, okay, I had to sell some Bitcoin. And it's like, well, that was predictable. Professional investors have diversification for a reason, right? Like something in your portfolio will be working and something won't. Different parts of your portfolio should do different things and they should have different characteristics. If everything in your portfolio does the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's not a portfolio. And that's when you, when you say professional investor, that's someone managing someone else's money or are you looking at also as just a personal investor? I, I, I would include investors that that's all they do. So yeah. I'm essentially a professional investor right now because even though I'm only making money for myself in a sense... I don't have any other source of income. Everything I do comes from my investing activities. Mm. So mm. I generate dividends, right? I generate capital gains when I sell a stock or a company that I'm invested in has a liquidity event. And even the board work, like it, that board work doesn't happen unless I have my investor cap on, right? Because I'm only really valuable to these companies to the extent at which, especially mm. at the early stages, I'm able to help them raise capital. Like all my other board seats outside of Iris came from, you know, making an early investment and helping the company grow. So I enjoy the company building process. And so if you're not a company builder, if you're not a CEO, if you're not a founder, like that argument's probably not going to make a lot of sense. You may feel like hundred percent of your portfolio should be in Bitcoin. And I don't personally have any problem with that, but because I could add unique value, right. Directly by being engaged in these companies, my returns are different. So like when I invested in Eaglebrook, for example, and when I invested in this other company home, I was the first seed investor in the entire company, right? I set the early valuation on the convertible note. I helped the CEO make the very early decisions on product and hiring and who the other investors should be and who their early customers should be. And in return for that, not only did I get the board seat and the visibility into the metrics and everything that was happening, I also got common stock. So basically I sit next to the CEO on the cap table as almost like a shadow co-founder. And so my returns on some of those, like just based on the current valuation, they're astronomical. I mean, they're like over the last two or three years, I think my Eaglebrook investment has beaten Bitcoin by like 10 X. Wow. And that's in a period where Bitcoin off the bottom went from what five, four or five K to 60 back to 20, right? And let's just say it's up four X. Well, my Eaglebrook investments up well over 40 X nice. collectively. Right. And so it's not, it's not that I think everything I'm going to do is going to beat Bitcoin. It's not that I think everybody else should invest in other things other than Bitcoin, because like Warren Buffett said, just because I 
can beat the S and P double the S and P for 50 years. Doesn't mean you shouldn't own an S and P index fund. I would give that same advice to someone else. I'd say, look, unless you want to be a seed investor in a whiteboard company with just a CEO who's 25 years old and yourself, and you want to be responsible for whether that thing works for the first two or three years until we get more investors and more capital and more customers Mm -hmm. and it's a bigger Mm -hmm. company, then sure, just put all your money in Bitcoin. Because I'm not recommending you do what I do, but what I'm doing is a little bit different than most people, right? So if, if your choice is put it all on Bitcoin or buy Carvana stock or Shopify stock, I'd say put it all on Bitcoin. But if your choice is, hey, you can seed something, you can be actively involved in building it and you can get extraordinary returns from layering and comment on top of your seed stage uh, preferred investment, then maybe that works. But that, that's not for everybody and most people shouldn't do that. Interesting. That's very inspirational for me to hear actually, Mike, because it's some of the beauty of Bitcoin is, uh, so I come at this from a perspective. So I inherited money as a young man. My father died early. Whole nother story we can talk about another time. But one of the challenges with that is you don't want to lose what you got given, but you have to trust other people to tell you what to do with it. Actually, that just creates other problems. So once I've you know really understood Bitcoin for what it is, it's like, oh, phew, all I've got to do is buy this stuff. And my, you know, the money I was very happy happy to be given, but sad to have received because my father's early death. I don't have to worry about it now. It's like that kind of intellectual requirement is is mm-hmm. is has been reduced and the stress can go. And that's like fucking happy days. And that's why I would just almost recommend to basically everyone don't bother with anything else, just buy Bitcoin. But to your point, if you're absolutely, you know, passionate about building things, you're interested in entrepreneurship, you've already been on this journey, as you explained, there's actually a lot of value you can add at an early stage of a business that will outperform Bitcoin and you enjoy sure. it, right? It's a passion. And so, it's the same thing so, with, so same thing with active synergy, investing, right? It's really cool. It's the same thing with active investing too, right? It is generally true that 90% of people would be better off just buying or 95% just buying index funds. But if your passion in life is investing, that would be like telling a world-class a mountain climber that because most people die climbing half dome without a rope, you shouldn't do it. Right. And it's like, well, no, you only get to do this fucking life once. And if you're world-class at something, you should fucking go do it. And what everybody else thinks about that is completely irrelevant. Only, you know, what you're capable of. And so I know for me, passively investing in anything is not going to work because I believe I have skill sets that can allow me to add exceptional value in certain circumstances. And if I just invest in index fund, I, I'm basically the mountain climber who stays in the gym. Like I could have gone and climb, I'm good enough to climb half dome, but I stayed in the, the soft rock climbing gym. So if I hit the ground, I would hit the soft mat, mm. right? That's, that's what that is. Right. And that's okay. Cause most people honestly are not trying to be exceptional. Like most mm. people are just trying to get by. They're just trying to survive, like feed their families and, and have everything work out. But if you have unique passion, if you have unique drive, if you have unique skill sets, then staying in that safe little gym when you should be out climbing half dome is a bad idea. Um, and so again, I do believe holding Bitcoin by itself is going to outperform almost everything, including the S&P mm-hmm. over time um, and most mining companies. But that said, I think if you find a handful of big winners, you will outperform Bitcoin by some wide, wide margin. Will the average person be able to do that? No. Will even most professionals be able to do that? No. But since I have the capability to potentially do it, I have to do it. I have to go climb it. You got to try stand, it. Okay. I can't stay in the rock climbing gym. That doesn't mean that everybody else should do what, I, what I'm doing. That said, everybody wants to know anyway. So they do say, well, what are you investing in? And I say, look, this is not a recommendation. This is not like, this is not what I, because I don't know your situation. I don't know how, how much money you have. I don't know what your risk tolerance is. I don't know your time horizon is. I don't know what your temperament is. Don't know but your skill for me, set. I don't know what your skill set is. Time but for availability. Me, don't you, know loads of shit. Yeah. Exactly. So I can't actually give you advice, but if you just <clears> want to know what I'm buying, I'll tell you. Right. And, and I think that puts the responsibility back on people. I'm not going to treat them like kids. Like if they want to go do something stupid, they can. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, but again, like uh, I don't tell people what to put their money into. I'll just tell you what I do. Yeah. Nice. I love that. So I've just, um, I've got one question before we wrap up Mike from, from Candice. She says, curious to hear his take on the bear market and Bitcoin. At what price point is he selling a kidney and buying more? Yeah. I've never gotten to meet Candice in person, but she's really, really funny. Fun to, to fun to follow. And she's like an extreme, she's even more extreme than me. She's done 200 plus mile ultras, which she tried to talk me into a year or two ago. And I said, I'm just too old. Like, I, I just don't have it in me to even do hundreds at this point. Wow. So she's, she's extreme and no, I'm not selling any kidneys, but I am going to deploy a lot more <laughs> capital. Like I really would love it if I don't think it's likely, but if it, Bitcoin were to go to 12 to 14 K over the next quarter or two, I will be there and I will be buying mm-hmm. at those levels. Cause at that level, even just to a 200,000 price is a pretty extraordinary return, like to mm. 10, 15, 16, 18 X, if it gets down to 12. 
or, or under, right? Like I, I had a vision the other day that it might go to 11.5. And if it, if it does, like, obviously I want to, I want to yeah, buy, like, <laughs> buy a lot more. And, and so do, do I know for sure what's going to happen? Of course not. I think people should stop trying to guess the exact bottom, right? You just need to continue to add over time. I think that's the best approach. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for sharing your journey with me today. I've, I've absolutely loved that conversation. Can you let people know where to get in touch with you if they want to reach out for whatever reason? Just at Mike Alfred on, on Twitter. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. Okay, friends, nice work. You made it all the way to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this conversation. As I said at the start, if you have any questions, then please don't hesitate to reach out. And if you enjoyed the episode, then please rate, like, subscribe, and share. That's it for now. Enjoy the rest of your day. All the best, Jake.